All right, so we're in Habakkuk. Now, have you ever heard it pronounced Habakkuk? Anybody? Habakkuk. Anybody have a preference for Habakkuk or Habakkuk? Well, I'm going to pronounce however it comes to my mind, so it's, <laughs> you're, you're, all, you're all good for that. Um, what I wanted to do today is uh, just, we're going to do, as we always do the, in the Minor Prophets, just do a short review. Um, this is what? How about that? Okay. And this was Obadiah. Was, remember the theme of Obadiah? Obad Edom. Obad Edom. Yeah. So yeah, it's a, am I my brother's keeper? Because you know, going back up the up the chain, uh, Edom was related is a son of Esau, a right? child and descendancy of Esau. Um, so we have uh, Obadiah, and the next one is Joel. Joel. And the theme of locusts and destruction. Um, so you'd be able to get this one. Yeah, this is the easy one. And this one is... <laughs> this one should be the, easy, the easiest one in the whole kit and caboodle, right? Yeah, so you have Nahum. And, uh, and the, re- the theme of a flood coming. The flood of, of people in invasion. Um, Amos, yeah, Amos. And the theme of... Plum line. Yeah, okay. And Alyssa's favorite. <laughs> and then uh, we look before at Micah. Yeah, Mike. Uh, and God's Day in Court. And then last week we looked at, or this week we're going to look at Habakkuk. And the theme of Watchtower. We'll, we get to chapter 2 and verse 1. We'll see. See, watch and the idea of watching a couple of times, but Habakkuk, Habakkuk. Right. So, I'd like you to turn with me in your Bibles to, uh, or you can actually read along with me. But Hebrew, Habakkuk, I'm going to say Hebrews a lot. I don't know why, just HB somewhere in there. But Habakkuk chapter two, verse four is really the theme verse of this one. Behold, as for the impudent one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous one will live by his faith. And we'll talk about this when we get there in detail. But this is really one of the key verses of the entire chapter. Um, here's, a, here's an outline for Habakkuk. And uh, if you're familiar, there's a, a, you wouldn't be familiar. A guy named Tom Sigamora, who's a, on the biblical counseling staff at Masters University, has come up with this uh, outline. He's got a wonderful little book, Habakkuk, God's Answers to Life's Most Difficult Questions. And these are the kinds of questions that we all ask in the midst of trouble, right? God, where are you when I need you? Anybody ever ask that question? <laughs> Anybody besides me ever ask that question? <laughs> Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do good things happen to bad people? And will I make it through this trial? Are all things that we all ask during very difficult seasons of our life. And what you're going to find is that the book of Habakkuk has those answers. And that's just a good thing. You would, how many of you expected to walk in and say, let's go back eh, 2,600 years and say, uh, is this book going to meet my needs today? And you find, yeah, that is some pretty relevant questions. So we're, we're, we're thankful to be able to get to that and, again, look at the, the, the issues that are there. Uh, you recall, again, and again, this is a bit of an eye chart, uh, but if we look at this area right in here of Habakkuk is right in here. Uh, notice the big red arrow in case you missed that one. Uh, but Habakkuk's right in here, and he's a, uh, a peer with Jeremiah and Zephaniah. And he, right after him comes Daniel and Ezekiel. Um, you also notice that at, at, in, right in the middle of Habakkuk's letter, the, the nation of Assyria goes away. And that's probably one of the important details is it, uh, of what God's doing there. But what begins to rise in its place is the nation, the Babylonian Empire begins to rise. And they'll be called, they'll be called by their old name. Um, and I want you to re- tell me who you think of when you hear the word Chaldea or Chaldean. Who is, who is, who is a very famous Chaldean in the Bible? Abraham, exactly. And so uh, we find that the, the, the nation has existed there in many ways, shapes, and forms. Um, but uh, as, as Chaldea changes and morphs into Babylon, uh, the succession of nations, uh, we're going to find that Babylon, or Chaldea, overtakes uh, Assyria. And that's going to cause the death of one of our favorite, famous kings, um, King Josiah. So it gives you kind of a, a place in history where these things are. 
Again, as I mentioned, Habakkuk was a, a, ter a ter contemporary of Nahum, Zephaniah, and Jeremiah during the reigns of Josiah and Jehoiakim. Josiah would be the king. He was a righteous king. We'll talk about him in a little bit more detail. But his son would not be Jehoiakim. Um, by the end of Habakkuk's time of ministry, Assyria is off the scene. Babylon, or the Chaldeans, are in power. Nebuchadnezzar defeats the Egyptians in 605 and is about to attack Judah. Jeremiah has an, had announced that Babylon would invade Judah, destroy Jerusalem and the temple, and send the nation into exile. And now this is happening right before their very eyes in 606 to 586. Habakkuk is a priest called to be a prophet. And what we find in this letter is it, or this letter, I'm thinking New Testament. And what we find in this book is that he's um, called to be a prophet and he wrestles with God concerning how a holy God could let a wicked nation like Babylon punish Judah. These things don't make sense to him. And so what we're going to find is, is God is, is very sovereign and God uses the tools at his hand to teach a very good lesson. At the same time, Habakkuk wrestles with the nation's spiritual decline. And why hasn't God done something about it? Habakkuk wanted to see the people revived, as we'll see in chapter 3, but God did not seem to be answering his prayers. And does God seem to be not answering your prayers sometimes as well? Again, what we're finding is this is a, while written 20 or 30, you know, 2,600 years ago, Habakkuk is a very contemporary book asking the very decent and right questions in our age. And one of the things I want to say at the outset, and I'll, I'll try to remember to wind it up as well, it's never wrong necessarily to ask these questions. It's a question of who we ask them to. It's never wrong to ask them of God himself. We see that in the book of Psalms, for instance, and there are 59 Psalms of Lament in the 150 Psalms that are there. People asking, you know, Psalm 13, how long, O Lord, is the beginning of wisdom because God is the only one who can answer those questions. If I start to ask the rest of you, how long should I have to go through suffering? Now I've turned my complaint into bitterness. But Habakkuk teaches us in the, line, the same lines as Psalm, it's not ever wrong to teach, talk to God that way because God is the only one who can answer those questions. Even if he doesn't answer directly, he's the one who changes our heart to rest and trust in him in the midst of our trials. So when we take a look at, uh, real quickly, uh, chap we're going to go through chapter 1. And I have to keep my, my uh, comments on point because um, I've got a baseball game to go to this afternoon. As I talked with Doug Bruni, it's, we're going to go see two losing teams figure out who wants to lose worse. <laughs> the Cardinals are playing the White Sox, in case you... My team's going to lose worse. What's that? My team's going to lose worse. Okay, yeah, probably. I'm hoping. <laughs> Her team would be the White Sox, yeah. by the way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, um, so chapter one. The pronouncement which Habakkuk the prophet saw. How long, Lord, have I, helped, I called for help, and, and do you not hear? I cry to you, cry out to you, violence, yet you do not save. Why do you make me see disaster and make me look at destitution? Yes, devastation and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. Therefore, the law is ignored, and justice is never upheld. For the wicked surround the righteous, therefore justice comes out confused. That people have problems is a statement that surely to get universal agreement. Yes? The Christians, that Christians have a problem is really a guarantee. Just look at Jesus' own words. In this life you'll have trouble. Or Paul's existential crisis in Romans chapter 7. The thing that I don't do, don't want to do, I do. And the thing that I do want to do, I don't do. Even though troubles are a guarantee, we still have issues with the, pray, the way that we have problems. How could God let this happen? And there are Christians who believe that, that Christ, there are Christians in our midst and Christians in the world in general who believe that Christians should not have problems at all. Now, which seems silly to me, given real life, but there are people who believe that something else can be claimed. They're, they're, again, they're, they aren't affected by the world's great difficulties as they occur around us. And this is exactly what Habakkuk struggles with is this idea of why are we having problems? We are your people. And what, what's going to happen is Habakkuk's going to get shown that, for, yes, we may be his people, but one, we bring our own sin to the table. And in the Old Covenant, there are ways of saying if there's 
Bless, there's blessing if there's obedience. There's cursing if there's disobedience. That's one of those universal truths as well. You know, when we follow the Lord, righteousness exalts the nation, yes? And yet, when the nation is not righteous, what happens? Disarray and discord, right? And we find the same thing happening in Judah at the time. The book opens the pronouncements which Habakkuk the prophet saw. The pronouncement doesn't sound like a title of a book I'd like to read, does it? The pronouncement. You can almost hear the dun dun dun. You might like to read maybe Overcoming Sin in Your Life or 150 Ways to Know God's Blessing. And those might be interesting things to read, but do they deal with real life all the time? And yet Habakkuk's word is the pronouncement. And you get in the background as if there's something lurking around the corner. How long, Lord, he says. It seems right out of Psalm 13. We hear the, the same words of, or the same sentiment, often enough in the rest of Scripture. And just to record, you know, kind of a bullet-pointed fashion, the nation of Israel, while in Egypt, are crying, how long, Lord, do we have to put up with this? In, in Exodus chapter 2. The sons of Israel, while God raised up Judge Othniel, in Judges chapter 3 are decrying the same thing. David in Psalm 22 and Psalm 30 and Psalm 72. And even Psalm 22 was quoted by Jesus. God prophesies what the nation would do to Isaiah in chapter 58. And God's going to say, God, and the people are going to say, how long? And of course, Jonah, our, the reluctant prophet, uh, the reluctant evangelist, has no interest at all because he knows how long do I have to put up with this cruel nation? God is the one who answers when we cry to him in our suffering, though not always when we want. Yes? He always answers, just not in the time or even the manner we expect. And we have to kind of pull on that thread to figure out what God is really trying to do. The sin of God's people may lead the Lord not to respond with deliverance immediately when they cry. We talked a couple of weeks ago about why, why are we in this spot, right? I just, I just don't have the, king, the king's... At this time, Manasseh has fallen from the scene, but because of his sins of child idolatry, because of the sins, na the nation of the sins in letting it go, and because of the entire nation never having the day of the year of Jubilee and the year of rest for the land, all those years accumulated. And God says there's going to be a year of captivity for every one of those that you missed. It's the nation's sins which have led it to the spot and have led it into idolatry. They're not innocent, even though they're God's people by covenant. It's their sins which have led them into this problem. So the sins of God's people may lead the Lord not to respond with deliverance when they cry. God may have another desire to let them know how much they sin and that there are consequences of having sinned and falling away into idolatry. In the day of the judges, the Lord forced the people to remember their sin before he even hinted at deliverance. Again, the book of Judges is a, is a theme of cycles of, you know, they'd fall, into, they'd fall into sin, they'd look for help, a deliverer would come about, but not after some time of judgment in the meantime, and then God would deliver, and they would do the same thing over and over and over and over again, a theme of cycles. The psalmist implies that a prolonged period of prayer <coughs> preceded his own deliverance, as we find in David in Psalm 22. So the first question that Habakkuk asks is, how long, O Lord? And then he comes to another question, how, how do you put up with sin? Verse 3, we see, look among the nations, watch, be horrified, be frightened, speechless, for I am accomplishing a work in your days. You would not believe it, even if you were told, for behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that grim and impetuous people who march through the earth to take possession of dwelling places that are not theirs. And you can almost hear Habakkuk saying, what? <laughs> These are, this is an idolatrous people. You're going to use them to punish us? What's up with that? And yet we found the same thing with Assyria and Israel in the north, didn't we? God uses tools at hand in order to teach us that he's the one who's sovereign. How long, Lord, is the first question. And what we find in the, in the answer is, I'm going to make you look at disaster. I want you to recognize your sin and your position. And until you get that, you're going to be looking at disaster. And then I will answer your questions. Then I will bring deliverance. And the second question, if it, uh, if the second question, how, how do you put up with sin, the sin, especially of the conquering nation? 
Verse 3 says, you know, why do you make me see disaster? Now, depending on which translation you have, it could be translated disaster or iniquity or injustice or evil deeds. Almost asking the question, are you deaf? Now, some of you, when you think, am I addressing God that way? You might want to stand over here while the lightning strikes over there. <laughs> but there's no sense of, you're absolutely wrong, but I'm, he's really saying, just in the same sense of, how long, Lord? He's asking the question, are you not hearing us? Are we not saying it right? There's an appeal that's coming out of his heart saying, is it, is it in me? Is, it, is this why my question is not getting answered? Why do you put up with sin and are you deaf? And verse 4 is really the fourth question. Here's, here are the cause for the disaster or the iniquity or injustice or evil deeds. It's because the leaders of the nation wouldn't obey the laws that they'd even created. And so God is letting those things run their course in order to teach the nation a lesson. But Habakkuk is asking the question of, are you just? Are you just? Are you here? Are you there? How long is this going to last? Questions we all ask in the midst of our own difficulties. And what Habakkuk does is gently walk through what God's answer to these would be in verses 5 to 12. The Lord responds in that section, he is doing something. As a preface to verse 5, you should be horrified and frightened speechless. That is the purpose of what you're seeing. It's not for the person to, to modif- you know, mollify or coddle you or you know, make you feel warm and fuzzy. That's not what God is most doing. God's trying to grab your heart. And when you're resting in your own righteousness... As if I'm not going to have sin in my world, I'm not going to do anything else because I'm, God's, I'm part of God's people. God's saying, that's, no, that's not the way that life runs around here. The Pharisees would make the same mistake. Are we not God's people? Is Jerusalem not our city? As if to say, because we live in Jerusalem, your holy city, nothing's going to happen to this. Except what happened 600 years before. God let the nation of Babylon invade Jerusalem and take it and all its residents captive. It is part of God's determined plan that you should be horrified when you see sin around you. More than just being encouraged that maybe the end days are coming, but be discouraged at the sin and unrighteousness we see around us and causing you to call upon the holy God who can and will do something about it in his time. He wants us to see, by even the things we see in our own nation and world today, he wants us to be horrified and frightened Not because of the things themselves, but because God is letting his his righteous hand withdraw just a bit to let sin run amok, to teach the nation a lesson. Righteousness exalts a nation. What would the contrary part to that be? Unrighteousness degrades a nation. And we see that around us, don't we? In the same way, God used the nation of Assyria to bring judgment to Israel 100 years ago. In that same way, I'm using the Chaldeans as my uh, armament of judgment, he called them the grim, impetuous, and greedy people from whence Abraham came. Now they're called the Babylonians. He's, he's using the, the Chaldeans or the Babylonians to accomplish his will. So we can say in one sense, it is not God's will for a nation to be unrighteous. It's not God's will for us to have to endure suffering. And partly that's true. But when the nation has no justice and the nation doesn't look at the Lord as the solution to its problems, God withdraws his, his, essentially his intervening hand and lets the nation run amok for a while and lets the nation learn that they need God in everything. And that is the will of God. We have hard times with that sometimes, don't we? How can God allow evil? Probably because evil accomplishes his purpose. Does God create evil? No. Does God use evil? Yes. So why do bad things happen to good people? So we've looked at the prophet's calling, we've looked at the passionate prayer, and we've looked at the astonishing answer of, I am busy. I am, number one, and I am busy among the nation. This is all part of the plan. Sometimes we have a difficult part, or difficult time saying, this is part of the plan, don't we? When we look around us, we see unrighteousness. We see um, people not getting along. We see the nation in, in decay. We go, this is part of God's plan? Frankly, yes. 
because we're meant to be learning a lesson about who the righteous God is. All right, so chapter 2. Or I should say, what we're going to do is review 1 and 2 from a different perspective and then come back and finish up uh, this, the first part of chapter 2. Why do bad things happen to good people? Uh, to review chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, is Habakkuk's lament and his ask. Do something, please. How long is really the beginning of we want you to do something about the things that we see? And we can understand why Habakkuk is asking this question. We're, we're your people, the people of your covenant. Evil and wickedness are on our doorstep. Do something. I mentioned that Habakkuk preached during the reign of good King Josiah. Um, what we're going to do is, is look in these first 11 verses of three kings. That are, or we're going to look at three kings in a little bit, but this first lament of do something. As I mentioned, in, in Habakkuk preached during the reign of good King Josiah. At the, at the end of Josiah's life, Assyria was still in power, ruling over Judah. I, have, I think I have a chart here. I do. Can you see that map at all? All right. It's really not meant to be that detailed for a reason. You see Egypt down here. You see Judah down here. What you don't see up off the chart are Assyria, which is here. And then a little bit further is Babylon. So Babylon is trying to conquer Egypt. And Assyria doesn't like Babylon. So Assyria <coughs> is coming to the aid of Egypt. Josiah is an idiot. <laughs> All right. So, um, so Assyria was still in power, ruling over Judah. Egypt was fighting Babylon, with Assyria giving aid to Egypt. Josiah um, saw his chance to get rid of Assyrian rule, and so he went to battle, blocking Egypt's advance. So Egypt is trying to go to the north to be with Assyria. Josiah goes out to the town of Megiddo over the, the Jezreel Valley and promptly dies because Pharaoh Necho kills him. In the, in the end, so in the end, Josiah actually chose the right side. Josiah was on the right side of history. He just chose to, the wrong battle and the wrong time. Assyria was defeated. Now Judah, though, is still, instead of Judah being ruled by Assyria, Judah is now ruled by Babylon. And Judah would, even later on the next year, or the same year, and the next 15 years in succession would be overcome, overruled, and taken captive, nearly two-thirds of the population back to Babylon. Things did not work so well for Josiah's decision. Habakkuk likely witnessed all three Babylonian invasions. In 605, they carried off the nobles and the princes. In 597, um, when they exiled the king and many others. And in 586, when they finally destroyed Jerusalem, and the temple and all of the treasury within it. Habakkuk could not have seen, foreseen the for, let me start again. Habakkuk could not have foreseen the scope of this tragedy as he was prophesying, but knew that God was raising up Chaldeans that was bad news for Judah. And that's what troubles Habakkuk. He's going, I see the circumstances surrounding us and the things that are coming aren't going to work out to our good. And yet there's nothing Habakkuk can do but stand by and proclaim, is it God who's in charge? So chapter 1, verses 1 to 11, is almost a lament in the very same idea of um, you know, Psalm 13 and the other lament psalms. Looking, you know, complaining to God, you know, tr turning to God, complaining to God, asking God, and then trusting God. And that's what you find, you find in, uh, even here in Habakkuk, in the, in the first chapter. That's the first lament. The second lament, in verses 12 to 17, the bad news that Habakkuk is witnessing uh, causes him to lament again. And amid that, he's reminded of God all over again. So I want you to turn to chapter 1, verse 12. We find out just some fun things and some startling things as well. Are you not from time everlasting? Lord, my God, my Holy One, we will not die. You, Lord, have appointed them to deliver judgment, and you, rock, O rock, have destined them to punish. Just that one single verse in the middle of the lament is probably one of the richest pieces of treasure in really in the entire book. Because what do we see here? We see, first of all, Habakkuk referring to God as eternal. 
Are you not from time everlasting? We find out something of the character of God. Even though Habakkuk's attention is on our circumstances and the pain and suffering that we're seeing around it, we find that the idea of Habakkuk reminding himself who God is as one who's eternal, not time-bound, not temporary, but eternal. This is the first thing. We find out also he's personal. He says, my God, my Holy One, you, Lord, you, O Rock. He's addressing them by personal pronouns. God's preferred pronouns, if you will. But he's addressing God as his God, not our God, not the God, my God. He's personal to him. He also describes him as being faithful. He uses the word rock as a metaphor to the very, not only is he eternal, but he's consistent and faithful. And he's always going to be that. Because what rock degrades in that sense? He's faithful. He he calls him Lord twice. Lord is his covenant name, the name by which he wanted to be known by Israel. And then finally, God is shown to be sovereign at the end of verse 12. You, Lord, have appointed. You, O rock, have destined. There's no sense of God sitting around waiting for things to, you know, wondering what's going to happen. I wonder what the man's going to do. I should react to that when that happens. But rather, you've appointed. You've destined. God is the one who is not only eternal and personal and faithful, but also sovereign and providential. He's using the strength of his might to accomplish his will. And the fact that Judah is undergoing problems is a miracle. (laughs) The fact that Judah is undergoing problems is a testimony to the fact that they're they're in idolatry and in sin and they ought to wake up. All right, and then then verse 13, we we figure out that God is holy and just. Your eyes are too pure to look at evil, and you cannot look away, or you cannot look at harm favorably. (laughs) Why do you look favorably at those who deal treacherously? Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those who are more righteous than they? So not only is God personal and powerful and faithful and sovereign, In verse 13, he's holy and just. In 14 to 17, he is incomprehensible. Why have you made people like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler over them? The Chaldeans bring all of them up with a hook, drag them away with their net, and gather them together in their fishing net. Even though he knows that that Chaldeans are a mortal threat to their very life, he knows that God is letting them have their way right now because of the sins of the nation. And in some sense, you see the thing starting to transform. Verse 16, Therefore they offer a sacrifice to their net and burn incense to their fishing net, because through these things their catch is large and their food is plentiful. Will they therefore empty their net and continue to slay nations without sparing? Their their content is that they're going to try, they're always going to be Chaldeans, they're always going to be Babylonians, they're always going to have this nature. And he kind of has the idea that God's going to deal with them at some point in the future. But now he's dealing with us. And yet he's trusting in the God who's faithful, who's eternal, who's personal, and who's sovereign, and who's holy and just. And he's reminding himself, and that brings him to the point of worship and praise and adoration. So that's the first lament and second lament. Now we come to verse 1 of chapter 2. I will stand at my guard post and station myself on the watchtower, which is why the uh, meme has... Habakkuk standing on the watchtower with all those watches around it. I will station myself on the watchtower and I will keep watch to see what he will say to me and how I may reply when I'm reprimanded. Notice the change in attitude of Habakkuk. Having lamented to God, he finds his spirit with inside him ready to trust the personal, sovereign, holy, just, righteous, everlasting God for the eventual salvation. He knows now he has a different role. He knows he has a pronouncement to make, but he's also going to sit back and watch what happens because what unfolds then is God revealing his will in the conquering of Babylon. And what that's going to do is usher in the details that will bring in the Savior later on. 
Much like Assyria, Babylon was known for their barbarity. They delighted in a nation's downfall. Why should God use them to punish his people? And yet what Habakkuk finds is his question gets turned around from why do bad things happen to good people? Habakkuk's question becomes how can God still be merciful when we deserve his holy wrath? He has a new new idea of who he is in God's sight. And yes, he's God's people, but recognizing he's still a sinner. And the nation is still sinning. The nation actually has no, no chains upon them at all in terms of their righteousness. It's all unrighteous. And that's running amok. And so his, his perception of himself changes that no longer is, am I privileged? Am I special? I'm not this great guy. But rather, our nation is sinful. We're deserving what we get. How can we not be even punished more? Because he's righteous and holy and we're not. His idea of who we are completely changes. So the Lord's answer in verses 2 to 4, wait patiently. Then the Lord answered me and said, write down the vision and inscribe it clearly on tablets so that the one who reads it may run. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hurries toward the goal and it will not fail. Though it delays, wait for it. For it will certainly come and it will not delay long. Behold, as for the impudent one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous one will live by his faith. And now you see the context of the righteous one shall live by his faith is in the context of one who's suffering because they are righteous, who's suffering because he's living amongst unrighteous people, an unrighteous people who's suffering the judgment because of their unrighteousness. He's not just a, you know, the righteous shall live by faith as if that's going to help us play a better basketball game or win a soccer game or baseball game on a Sunday afternoon. He's rather saying, In the midst of great suffering, I will live on because of the faith that you have given me. We find ourselves in that exact same spot, don't we? It's difficult to look around us, even in our nation the way it is. It's difficult to look around us and saying, how long, Lord? Why don't you fix this now? And yet there are lessons to be learned as God lets it drag on. There are lessons to be learned about who we are in God's sight and to think about his sovereignty, his personalness. His, his not being time-bound whatsoever, his eternality. We want to learn the character of God in the midst of this difficulty, and that's what it means to live by faith, to trust based on the faith that we have. The prayer is heard, and God commands the contents of the vision to be recorded and communicated. In verse 4, when he says the impudent, it means to be puffed up or arrogant, which described full well the Babylonians. And the conclusion, by the way, which is kind of a weird way to say it, his soul is not right within him. And you, I've, you know, part of the South comes up into me and says, that boy ain't right. (laughs) This could well describe Nebuchadnezzar and many of the kings of Babylon to follow. And what you find actually is that Habakkuk is not just temporal in the sense of, yes, it's for this period and this time, but actually describe in some sense the relief that's going to come when the Medes and Persians overcome Babylon. God will listen. It is his time then to show Babylon how arrogant they've been. And God will bring them to task in judgment. (coughs) Again, we read in Psalm 32, 11 this morning, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. Don't make yourself righteous in order to be joyful, but rather the joy... The righteousness that God has given you, the the life that God has given you, rejoice from that perspective. Rejoice in in the God whom you know is the very thing that that, um, Habakkuk is saying. And just real briefly, uh, to to move along, the rest of chapter chapter 2, in verse 9, verse 12, verse uh, 15, verse 19, I think I've forgotten one. All these woes that are there. There There's impending judgment coming upon the nation. And yet, verse 20, what's it say? But the Lord is in his only temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Even in the midst of our difficulty, let us stop and rejoice in the personal, loving, sovereign God who lets difficulties happen to us to transform us, to get his attention, to become vessels fit for use. All right, that brings us to chapter 
three as we begin to wind down. Why do bad things, why do good things happen to bad, uh, actually, I, I'm going to skip this section. I may come back and do this some other day. There's a whole series of lessons about Habakkuk and past kings and future kings. It's, it's fun to see. We just don't have time today. But uh, so mark it on. Coming to a slot near you. Maybe a Sunday evening service before. All right, so this brings us to do the, the, the final section. Will I make it through this trial? All of chapter three. So here we find in chapter 3, Habakkuk's final prayer. And notice it's a prayer, it begins this way, a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, according to Shigonionoth. Shigon, Shigonionoth. If you know how to pronounce it better, let me know. Um, I had a guy who, who taught me back in college. He says, you know, you just pronounce it the best and you move along and don't bring attention to yourself and no one will ever know. And I've just violated all that. But the idea, um, and, and all the translations transliterate this, because that's actually, it's actually the Hebrew word brought into English. There's no, no sense of translation of this means that. You just think, like, how many of you know what Shigonianoth means? Yeah, nobody knows. Well, we do. We actually have, have an idea. Um, the idea might be a, it's a, um, more like an emotional poetry or a passionate song. Um, but the prayer that, that Habakkuk prays was recorded and set to music, even probably that Jesus prayed and sang. This prayer would have been recorded for Jesus to sing in, in, in chapter 3. And what do we read? Lord, I have heard the report about you, and I was afraid. Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known in anger, remember mercy, God comes from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. We begin to find Habakkuk's prayer of deliverance is a prayer of rejoicing. Habakkuk is overwhelmed by God's splendor and his majesty. In considering the questions he had to be asking, the answers point to God's faithfulness in himself, in, to the covenant, to his justice, and to the fulfillment of prophecy. And we didn't cover it, but actually, Josiah's decline and demise is all due to, to Hezekiah's revelation of, hey, we got all this money in the treasury. You want to see it? Or what? He just says that. He's like bring Berwin or something. You want to see this all this treasury or what? And the nation of Babylon remembers, whenever we get to conquer Jerusalem, there's a bunch of money to be had, all in gold, that Hezekiah showed us. And that was Josiah's undoing. And there was prophecy that... Hezekiah's children would be sent into slavery as eunuchs as a result. And sure enough, it would be Jehoiakim and Jehoiakim who would be sent off blinded to Babylon. So all this period of time is, is a fulfillment or prophecy of something that happened 100 years ago. And yet we find a prayer of praise and adoration for the God who controls the events of the universe. Habakkuk is in awe. Not only at the, affected, at the nations affected by God's plan and the execution of that plan by his power and majesty. All of creation reflects that as well. We're, we see the brightness of light. We see the plagues and pestilence. There are earthquakes. Entire nations suffer at God's command. And somewhere in this last section, along about verse 16, Habakkuk's fear is changed to faith. Let's read chapter 3, verse 16 together. I heard and my inner parts trembled at the sound. My lips quivered. Decay enters my bones and in my place I tremble because I must wait quietly for the day of distress for the people to arise who will attack us. Habakkuk goes from these laments and torments in chapter 1 of how long are you there? Do you hear? Are you deaf? To I must wait and wait patiently for the nation that God's bringing along to judge us. I'm going to be on the watchtower, as we read in chapter 2. I'm going to be viewing God in the, in the glory of all his display, control all the details to make it happen, and bring the nation to judgment. And you know, the interesting part, when the nation gets sent into exile, when they come back, they do not practice that same idolatry again, ever. That's not to say they don't practice some form of idolatry. But the nation being led into captivity were taught a lesson that they learned and learned well. 
Habakkuk is in awe. Somewhere, again, his, his fear is changed. He says that he's frightened when he heard about the works of God. He knows that, that about that time, God's victory over the enemy might be long in coming. And yet, while he waits for the ultimate victory, he says that he will rejoice and exult in the Lord, even though there may not be any visible or external signs of, of his presence or favor. I'm going to trust that God will do what he says, even though I can't see it necessarily, even though it may happen long after I'm gone. But the righteous will live by faith. So we finish up in 17 to 19. Even if the fig tree does not blossom there, and there's no fruit on the vines, if the, if the yield of the olive fails and the fields are, produce no food, even if a flock disappears from the fold and there are no cattle in the stalls, yet I will triumph in the Lord. Is that the same Habakkuk? Is that the same Habakkuk who's rejoicing in God and his presence and his faithfulness who we heard in the beginning? No, he's, he's been changed and transformed from the inside out. Now he knows that God is the one who will act and is acting. Yet I will triumph in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he has made my feet like deer's feet, and he has, has me walk on my high places. For the choir director on stringed instruments. It was a prayer meant to be sung, and this was instruction to the choir director on how it was to be done. And it was to be done with emotion and, and feeling, because we are going from changed from being unjustified and uncared for to understanding God's truth and his God's providence and God's glory. So to kind of wind up things, and I'm two minutes over, Habakkuk had given this pronouncement, but what he finds out by the time he gets to the end of the chapter is that the nearness of his God is his good. He trusts in the sovereign God. He waits for those days, even to the point of running to the highest mountain and shouting it from the rooftop. Shouting it from the mountaintop, as you find in verse 19. He has made my feet like deer's feet, and he's made me walk in the high places. Suffering is difficult, yes? yes? But what God wants us to do in that midst is to trust him and to watch and see him act. And when we do, we have a sense of the presence of a personal, sovereign God. And we can go to the rooftops and the mountaintops and praise him. Let's close in prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you for the short message of Habakkuk. We barely have made it through and skipped over a number of parts. But these things are, are, bring us joy to recognize that you are in the midst of our difficulties. You are the one who hears. You are the one who's personal with us. You're the one who's care, who's holy and just. And yet you're bringing about your sovereign will in accordance with your plan from the foundation of the world. This brings us comfort and joy, and yet even though that doesn't deal with the loneliness or the difficulties we deal with now, Lord, we are comforted to know that you're in control and that all that our trust rests in you. Be with us. Give us strength for the trials we endure, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.